Innocent Nyakina Gisesa from the School of uh, from the School of Built Environment, Department of Energy and Environmental Engineering. I'm going to take you through a unit by the name Mathematics for Valuation, whose code is BEG 2119. The objectives of the course, they are already shown here, is to provide an overview of uh, property valuation, both statutory and non-statutory valuation, and then to give an overview of the various trends which are happening in the property in terms of technology and suggest the best ways forward in, uh, on how they're being undertaken. What do we expect a student to uh, gain at the end of um, the course? The first thing, you are expected to be awarded a postgraduate diploma from the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya. Then after you have gained that, you are given what you call a full membership of ISK, which is called MISC. And then there's the registration and licensing board, which is VRB. And then we have, of course, you can again do ERB, which is the Estate Agents Registration Board. There are a definition of terms, which I'm going to take you through. As you can see, we have land. Land is anything that comprises soil to the center of gravity and anything which is above it up to the sky. Then what is property? Property refers to the interest someone has uh, either in land, the chattel, the chattel refers to anything which is uh, fixed on land which can include something like the masts. Then we have a definition of other terms again, real property. Real property refers to the interest someone has in, a, uh, someone has in property which can be Leasehold and freehold. A leasehold, these are, um, these are interests which happen for a given duration of time, such as like 99 years, or a freehold, which are passed on from family or from generation to generation. Then there is another definition of personal term. Personal terms can be the computers. Usually they don't have a registration of rights in them. Or they can be even the books which you use in class. Then there are more definitions there. There's another definition of the meaning of the word real estate. It relates to land and all imp improvements which are p permanently attached to land. And then what is valuation? Valuation refers to a process of determining the value of a given property or of any given asset. Then we have the basis of value. The basis of value refers to the assumption an individual takes so that they can be able to arrive at a given at a given uh, valuation. Then approach. Approach is a systematic process of doing the valuation process. Then we have the method. The method, these are the various stages you undergo, which basically we have three methods of valuation. There's the income approach, and then there's the, the cost approach, and the sales comparable approach, which I'm going to discuss at a later stage. Then we have the gross internal area which is an area of uh, a building which is measured from within the building. Then we have the net internal area. The net internal area, it's an area which is measured from within the building, but removing the, the sizes of the walls. Then what is valuation? Valuation is defined in two ways. Valuation is an art and it's a science. It's an art because it is subjective. It's a science because it's objective. What is the difference between subjective and objective? It's subjective because it's a systematic process which two different values can use to arrive at a given value. But it's objective because that at times when you can value a property and when you're valuing the property you get that you don't have maybe the enough sales comparables or enough information to be able to arrive at a given value. Valuation is both an art and it's a science. Why is it defined to be an art? It's an art because it's uh, subjective. It's a science because it's objective. Subjective means that, uh, which is now a science, two, very, uh, two different values can be able to arrive at the same uh, value by considering the various factors through which a property is exposed to. It's objective because it's uh, objective because two different values again can arrive at a different value 
given the same property. I'm going to elaborate that. Generalities. We look at the generalities about valuation. There are many myths. There are actually five myths about valuation. The first one, it's a quantitative approach. A quantitative, remember, it's all about numbers. Uh, and then the second myth, a well-researched valuation, which has been done very well. It can be able to be used for many years. Then there's a myth number three. A good valuation should give a probable and an exact estimate of the value. And then there's another myth, a myth number four. The more quantitative a model, the better the valuation. The more quantitative it means, the more well-researched a given valuation is, the better the valuation. Then there's a, a myth number five. The product of valuation, i.e. the value, is what matters. We don't care about the process, which I've used to arrive at the given value. Then there's myth number three. A good valuation will always give uh, the best estimate. Then there's a myth number four. The more quantitative the model, the better the valuation. And then the product of valuation is what matters and not the valuation. Valuation as a science, I've already said, it's all about objectivity. And I've already explained valuation as an art. Why is evaluation needed? There are various reasons as to why evaluation is needed. One of the first reasons, it can be about insurance. It can be maybe to take a mortgage. Another reason, it can be to assess the tax or business rates payable to obtain a compensation, like the, the compensation which I've been having for the SGR, and among other things. Then to borrow money using the property as a security, that is now mortgage, to show its value at a given time on the balance sheet of a company. You understand what is a balance sheet? A balance sheet, you were taught this in high school, it's what it has got the credit and the debit side, whereby you have the fixed assets, the current assets, and then you have the capital, and then you have, um, you have the capital, and then you have, of course, the liabilities. Then you can use a valuation to develop a given land. Remember, so a, value can, um, a, cast, a client can come to you, wants to know what the land can be used for. You advise the client, maybe you can put a hotel, maybe you can put a petrol station, depending on the various dy dynamics there. Then it can be used for litigation. That's a compulsory acquisition uh, proceeding. Then there's financing and uh, credit. Then there's investment counseling and decision making. What are the skills required of a valuer? A valuer, remember, is also a landed man. He needs to have many, many skills. He needs to have the research method, the calculation, the measurements. There's the report writing, which is so crucial, and I'm going to touch again on this report writing. He needs to have negotiation. He needs to know how to negotiate with the clients. Then he needs to have uh, some, some knowledge in law. A lot of knowledge is needed, especially uh, in case like of a forced sale or a compulsory acquisition. Then there is management and business finance, working knowledge, economics and politics, because economics and politics con uh, contribute a lot towards the determining of the value of a given property. Then there's a knowledge of the building construction. Remember, in our industry, we work in tandem with the engineers, with the construction managers, and with the quantity surveyors. Then there's awareness of the environmental issues. Some of these topics you have learned. On the environmental issues, we remember you need to assess. When you're doing a, a construction in a given area, what does the rules of that given area define as to what property you can be able to construct? Then the main tasks undertaken by valuers. There are quite a number of tasks, tasks which can be undertaken by valuers, receiving and confirming instruction, inspecting the property, liaising with the client, and then researching and analyzing. Then there's carrying out of calculation. Remember, we have a lot of calculation, like uh, in the cost approach, in the income approach, instructing solicitors on behalf of a client or employer, and then there's providing property advisory and management services. Why are the services of a, prof a professionally qualified value are required? There are many reasons. The, the market uh, for property is imperfect. Be remember, there are many interests which are within a property. The landed property is heterogeneous. You can have a property, one piece adjacent to another one. The two will never have the same value. Then there's the legal interest therein are complex, and the laws relating to landed property are complicated. Then difference between evaluation and a survey. A survey. Evaluation 
is a process of finding the value of a given property at a given time for a particular purpose. But a building survey is, a, is being undertaken in order to determine the condition of a given building at a given time so that you can be able to determine whether there is any maintenance that is needed to be undertaken. The level of accuracy expected of a valuer, any given two valuers uh, doing a valuation of a given property at any given time, they're supposed to be have an accuracy of uh, not exceeding 5 to 20 percent. Remember, accuracy is so important. You can, you can overvalue a property. Someone takes a loan and they default in payment and the bank fails, uh, fails to sell the property. Then in deciding whether the bracket should be widened, that is the 5% to the 20% of accuracy, the court will consider the following factors. Unusual nature of the property. A property, remember, unusual nature, like a cemetery, uh, or like uh, a mortuary. Those are some of the initial nature of the property. Then the lack of comparables. Remember like churches. It's very rare to find a church being sold. Then there's the high value of a property. These are like institutions like ours which may be are being sold. It's very rare to find another institution like ours here in Thika. Then there's the extreme market condition. An extreme market condition can be like in a condition like today when you are having coronavirus and things are not working out the way they're supposed to be working out. Then there's the restrictive instruction of the client. The client wants you to do a valuation for a particular purpose. There's a way he wants you to do the valuation. And always, you cannot go against the instructions of the client. Factors of value. There are four factors. Utility. Utility uh, refers to the usefulness of the property. Then there is scarcity. Remember, property is fixed. You cannot extend the size of land which you have. Then there's the desire. Someone must have the desire to own that given property. Different people want to own different properties. Then there's effective purchasing power. You might be having the desire, but you don't have the money to buy that property. Then foundation of valuation. They are the agents of production. Those are the foundation. There's land, there's labor, there's capital, and entrepreneurship. I want to believe I've already discussed what is land. I've already also talked about labor and you know what is capital. Capital can be like the machines, the vehicles we use. And then entrepreneurship, this is a person who comes up with a business idea. Then the principles of value. The following are the principles of value. There are many. There is uh, anticipation, maybe the value will change after some time or not. There is the change, there is the supply and demand of that value. Then there's the competition, then there's the substitution, then there's opportunity cost. Remember opportunity cost, this is the best foregone alternative in order to, to satisfy other alternatives in terms of priorities. Then we have the balance, contribution, conformity, and extremes, externalities. Then forces that influence real property values, there's the social, uh, the social forces, where you come from, your culture will always control you on what property you want to own. Then there's the economic forces, these are like money uh, and all the other issues. There's the government forces, the restriction which are being put in place by the government. And then, then of course there's the environmental factors which refers to weather and climate. Then rights and interest in uh, land, there's the freehold interest which I've already which I've been explaining now and again. The result, which I've okay, again explained many times. There's the group interest, like the Maasai own land communally. There's the encumbrances. Encumbrances, this is uh, when you take a loan, maybe from the bank, and the bank retains your title. Then we have the servitude, where we have easement, profits, and restricted covenant, which again I've always explained this many times. Now, this is now another very interesting part. There's the evaluation process and the methods of evaluation. What is the evaluation process? Is a systematic procedure employed to provide the answers to the client's question. Evaluation process consists of four steps. There's the I identify the appraisal problem. Why are you undertaking the evaluation? Which we have given maybe for sale, for purchase. Then identify the appropriate solution. Which method are you going to use? Income, cost, or sales comparables. Then execute the appropriate scope of work. This is the extent to which the, the client wants you to undertake the evaluation. Then report the findings and conclusions reached from your evaluation. That will be in the report, which I'm going to come there again. Then we have the evaluation approaches. We have the market approach. This is the sales comparables. 
we have the income approach. Income approach consists of a situation whereby you get the, the income which is being generated by that property over a given period of time. And then there's the cost approach. How much did it take uh, for the client to construct the property? And here we use the, what we call the square feet or the meter square of that given property. Then depreciation. Depreciation, this is the diminution. Diminution refers to the decrease in value of an asset due to wear and tear or obsolescence over a given accounting period of time. Uh, there are basically three methods of uh, calculating depreciation. There's the straight line method, there's the sum of the digits method, and then there's the reducing balance method. There are some uh, examples you can see there. How does a straight line method work? For instance, the value of a given property is 500,000. Is 500, you divide by a given, uh, the useful life of that given property is like 10 years. The useful uh, life refers to the life you expect to be owning that property. So it's 500,000 divided by 10. So per annum, that property is decreasing in value by 50,000. Then there is the sum of the digits. Sum of the digits, if the property has got uh, 10 useful uh, life, you, you count 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, up to 10, you get it's 55. So in the first year, the depreciation will be 10 years times 500,000 uh, 500, divided by 55. The depreciation will be 90,000. In the second year, the depreciation, that is uh, the second year, it's 9,500 uh, divided by 55. Again, you get that one. You continue up to the 10th up to the 10th year, which is a useful economic life. Then you have the reducing balance method. The reducing balance method, this method is rarely used. The reason as to why it has got this value, it's called the salvage value, which again, some people refer to us as the scrap value. This is the value you expect the property to be having after a given period of time, which is 10 years. Remember, it's very hard to predict the value of a given property after a, a given long period of time. So there are a lot of assumptions which are involved here, and this process is rarely used. But if we are to use it, it is 1 less the square root of, uh, oh, th that, that is 10. Remember, it's 10 years. Then it's 20,000 over 500, which is the initial value of the property times 100, you get the percentage you're supposed to be using, uh, the percentage you're supposed to be using in each year. Like in the first year, it's now going to be 27, 27.52%. Uh, 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 remember, this is out of 100. Then times 500, you get the, you, you get the depreciation. Then this depreciation, you subtract it from 500, you get the value in the subsequent year. Then after I've gotten the value in the subsequent year, and again you multiply by the 27 times 362, you get the depreciation. Again, you reduce it from uh, 362, 400, uh, less 99, 733, you get the value in the subsequent year. You continue on and on up to, up to the end. You have again talked about depreciation. So there are forms, there are different forms of depreciation. We have the physical depreciation. This relates to age. There are two categories of physical uh, depreciation. There's one which is curable and another one which is incurable. A curable one, you can be able to maintain. Incurable, you cannot be able to maintain. Then we have the functional obsolescence. As with physical deterioration, functional obsolescence can be divided into two categories, curable and uncurable. And then, of course, you have the external obsolescence, which again relates to physical. Then you have the discounted cash flow. Uh, the principle underlying the valuation of a future income flow within the investment method of valuation is that the future income can be able to be discounted at a given percentage. For instance, you project like in the first year, you are going to get... 1 million. In the second year, you are going to get another 2 million. You take a given percentage, like 10%, in order for you to be able to discount those future cash flows so that you can be able to find the net present value as per today. Then the two principal methods of the discounted cash flow calculation of emerge. There is the net present value or the NPV method and there is the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is used to calculate the most perfect 
rate you are going to use. What the net present value, as I've said, is to find the present value of that given uh, property based on the future cash flows. Then there's the internal rate of return method. As an alternative to the net present value method, an analysis can be carried out with discounts. All future receipts and payments received equal to the discounted payments. This discount rate will then show the actual return, rate of return, or the capital invested in the scheme. The internal rate of return at this point will give you the net present value. Then there is a purpose of the highest and best use. The purpose of the highest and best use has also been referred to hub. This is when someone has got a property and you want to determine the best value that property can be used for. Remember someone who has a, a, a bigger uh, piece of land, like uh, maybe 50 by 100 or 100 by 100, can be able to put up um, a block of apartments, and someone who has got maybe land of around 40 by 70 can be able to put up maybe a personal house where he can be able to stay. So why, why determine this highest and best use of land as, as top vacant? There are three reasons to identify the highest and best use of land as top vacant in an appraisal. is to estimate the land value, which, which you use the sales comparables, and then to estimate the land value, which to use the... Uh, the, uh, to identify the comparable sales of vacant and then to identify the external obsolescence and then of course there is the highest and best use of property as if it is improved. Highest and best use property has improved. The highest and best use of property has improved is unraised for two reasons. The first is to identify the property use that can be expected to produce the highest overall return for each dollar of capital invested. Remember various property can be used for various reasons, maybe for industrial purposes like the industry we have, maybe for special purposes like the churches we have, maybe for business purposes like the business we have. The second reason is to estimate the highest and best use of our property has improved in order to help, uh, help identify the comparable properties. Then the criteria in highest and best use of uh, property, the highest and best use of both land as store vacant and property improved must meet four criteria. It must be legally permissible, physically permissible, financially feasible, and maximally productive. Then we have non-statutory evaluation. Non-statutory evaluation, these are evaluation which are not guided by any principles of law. These are basically done for private purposes. And this, in, and this include valuation for mortgage, valuation for development properties, valuation for insurance, valuation for auction, and valuation for shares. Then, valuation for special purpose. This is the valuation which can be done for business enterprises, the petrol stations, the hotels and restaurants, the recreational facilities, including cinema halls, clubs, parks, etc., institutional properties, including schools, halls, and places of worship. Then there are various acts which are, uh, which will uh, read in your own time. There are so many. We have the Land Act 2012, uh, the Estate Duty, Public Trust Administration Valuation, the Way Leaves and Easement, the Alienation Valuation, Extension and Renewal of Leases, Subdivision Valuation, Change of User, Conversion of Leasehold to Freehold Valuation, and then Calculation of Royalty. Those are like the mining valuation. Then valuation for stamp duty, which are Again, I've given you uh, an act there which guides it. And then there's the valuation for rating. This is to determine the rates an individual is supposed to pay for their own land. And then the basis of valuation, open market value for, of an improved uh, site. Then the valuation method, there's the direct compul uh, compulsion approach, which is most used. But the value is free to use any method to deliver the value of land at a particular time. Then, of course, there's the valuation procedure which you are going to use. Always remember, these procedures are so crucial. There is no procedure which is not important. That's all I had for today. Maybe we'll share some other time. Like, just for a, a reminder, in terms of this basis of valuation, the basis of valuation uh, is usually used when determining how you are going to undertake a valuation. Imagine someone is giving you a hotel. A hotel is supposed to be generating money from day one to day two, maybe to day three. 
how are you going to use the income approach or the cost approach in determining the value of that hotel? So what you are going to do, you are going to ask for the books, the, the books of that hotel owner. You see, like, how much have they been making? Then after they have given you the records, remember some of our business people in Kenya, they might be very corrupt and they might make these books up. You always ask for uh, the hotel which you have value. Then you take another hotel, maybe a nearby, so that you try to compare. Because there is no way someone can be able to make a lot of money out of the ordinary compared to the, their fellow business people whom they are working together with. The same applies also to the, to the petrol station. You have to take those records. In the cost approach, you have always uh, the, the quantity surveyors, the QS, they have what you call the bill of quantities. The bill of quantities, they have come up with the calculation. How much the cost which is being used in constructing maybe a business or, a, or, or anything in Nairobi and the rate which is being used in, an, in doing another con, um, construction maybe in Kisumu or in Eldoret, always keep on differing. A rate which is being used maybe in Meru cannot be a rate, cannot be similar to a rate which is being used here in Thika. But maybe co comparing on uh, the, dynasty, uh, the dynamics of the two places, there are some towns you can be able to compare very, very easily. For instance, if you go to, uh, to a town such as uh, Chuka, might be comparing very easily to another town like Chogoda, which are almost similar. But some of these big hotels is never e easy to compare the two. And then, of course, we have the annuities. Don't forget about the annuities. An annuity due, these are payments which are made at, at the beginning of a given trading period, at the beginning maybe of year one or year two. But an, an annuity, an annu a deferred annuity, these are payments which are expected to be made at the end of a given period. And all this always go back to the determining of the discounted cash flows in order for you to be able to arrive at the net present value of all this calculation. And when you come to, when you are doing um, something crucial again, I might have forgotten to have touched it in my notes, between the difference between the statutory and the non-statutory valuation. The statutory valuation are being done by valuers like me, a valuer who is not, being em who is not employed by the government. But uh, for statutory, they are done by valuers who are employed by the government. They are the one who have been given the mandate. They are the one who understand the dynamics of doing the valuation for the stamp duty, and they are the ones who can be able to do the valuation for the, for the extension of leases because they, they have the knowledge. For us, we just have knowledge of what we can be able to do in the field. So as a, as a, as a completion of uh, my presentation, I want to say that um, in any valuation, don't take it as easy, but always do your research very well. Always know the method you're supposed to use and always know what you're supposed to look out for in the market. So as a completion, I want to say thank you. See you next time. That's all I had to present for today. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.